ideas that he's going to share with you today are ideas that are starting to actually permeate a number of the STEM courses at OSU. Not all of them yet, but we're working on it. Um, when I was at the Ohio um, Project Kaleidoscope conference earlier this year, I sat down next to Ted in a session in which he was going to speak later, and every talk ahead of him talked about how last year his talk had inspired them to talk about the stuff that they were sharing in that session. So I was sitting next to a celebrity. It was kind of cool. So anyways, um, so if you are not yet a member of the Ted Clark Fan Club, I think you will be after this. So thanks for coming and uh, telling us about metacognition. Right. See if I can negotiate the technology here. It will come on at some point. I think I'm connected. Let's see if it comes on. The, uh, as we give that a pause, so uh, sort of on this Ann Arbor side, so I was travel. I yesterday I was fortunate enough to give similar talk with this to some folks at Dayton, and so uh, it's like, well, I'm already sort of on the west side of the state. This is going to be a good fit. So um, as I was thinking about my upcoming agenda, then it was like Thursday, driving, and I hear. Uh, a Bob Seger song come on, turn the page, okay? Now, Bob Seger is from Ann Arbor, Michigan, okay? Are folks familiar with the song? Yeah. All right. I can't help but get goosebumps when I hear that song come on, okay? So it's about being rock star, life on the road, but, you know, he's really inspired when he's in front of them, the crowd, okay? And it's like, hmm, I'm giving several talks in a row here. I feel like I'm going to turn the page. <laughs> now, Close. having said that, oh, within this, the uh, I also feel like that the warm-up act is going to be tough to beat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, uh, I think I might need to push another button. Yeah. No, I, I need. I feel like I need a roadie. Do you need? Um, do you have a, a say memory stick? I know this one works. And we could I put a memory stick. Yeah, I can go to Plan B. Okay. Go in here. So help me out if this comes up. So I'm imagining we've got a, a, a physics crowd. How many folks are primarily a high school setting? Okay. How about those that are not high school setting? Help me out within that. Is that um, uh, higher ed in some way? Combination within that? Okay. So So this is um, uh, some information, a talk that I, I know at least a few familiar faces have heard, uh, heard me share some ideas on this. So I hope at least for the people that are repeat, I've got a couple of subtle twists along the way that might help, uh, help you remain interested. Okay? This is a relatively new area for me. Uh, if you were to ask me what does it mean to teach at Ohio State in chemistry, um, four or five years ago, this would not have been on my radar at all. I would said, I teach chemistry, okay? I had heard the, uh, the criticism that Carl Wyman has voiced of, how many times are you with colleagues where they say, you know, my students are struggling either because they came to my class with poor preparation 
or they're not working hard enough. It's not on me. It's those two variables, and it's like, man, every time I'm sitting at a group, that's what people say. So I don't want to be putting it on the student to be a different way. It might be my practices in the space. Let me work on my practices in the space. And I've come to learn my practices in the space are helping to support their learning strategies. Okay? Uh, my chair uh, was fortunate enough to hear uh, Dr. Sandra McGuire discuss this book that she has, Teach Students How to Learn. She was so impressed by it that she came back to our department and bought a big stack of these that she distributed to all of the people that teach general chemistry. I read it, and a lot of people did not. They were good students, right? <laughs> so they had the big stack within here. And this is usually where I pause, and my joke is, OK, I'm going to stop talking. Everyone go online right now and order this book, because that is going to be more important than anything that I can say. The reason that spoke to me so much is she has this line where it says, how often does this happen? The student comes to you after an exam and says, I can't believe how poorly I did. I'd never struggled on a test in high school before. I didn't even recognize the questions. I think I'm not good at chemistry. How often do I get this? Every single exam. And so she's, the, what she gives within this is then a roadmap to say, how do you address this student's concern? How do you actually now move this forward? So it's like, I, I have to learn that. Quick, thought as far as the context. I teach large enrollment general chemistry classes, about 300 plus at a time. This right here shows sort of a sense of the students coming to OSU right now. So the black histogram, those are the ACT scores of the students. So we're at about the 90th percentile now for an average score for what the students come in with. We've used a standard final exam for a couple years right now, and we average about the 90th percentile too. So we're doing no harm, at least, within the space. <laughs> and it's also showing that the students come in with a stronger ACT, they're more likely to score higher on the final. This, though, shows the variability that we see within our results. If you come in with a 35 or 36 on the a ACT, I'm confident that I can predict your score in the class. But as soon as we go down a little bit, we get a huge variability. Different students are performing at different levels. So that's what we wanted to try to support, explore. So what we've done is I use a pretest at the start, and this shows whether they're taking the course on sequence or off sequence. I did this pretest to get some information that would be related to their first exam. And then I was really interested in targeting these students that were uh, struggling when they came in. Lower prior knowledge than I would say their peers. So what I did within that, I used that initial data, and I reached out to the lower one third of the students. And I said, I'm holding this special session that will lead to success in this class. I'd really like you to attend. On the day of that, I also told my class as a whole, hey, tonight we're leading a special session. I'd like you to attend. That led to about 150 students attending. The remainder did not, OK? 450 did not. We have since changed our strategy at OSU. And instead of doing a nighttime one with this, Every single general chemistry class, we do this as an in-class intervention. Okay? We are gonna, I'll show what goes on. We are so convinced that this is worth dedicating one class period to. And I mean, that's, that's a sizable portion. If we have class twice a week, one of the classes along the way would be dedicated to the information that I'm going to share right now. Okay? So what I'd like to do now is pivot a little bit. And you're going to be the students that hear this information. You are going to be the students that showed up for a success in chemistry one, OK? Now, I want you, first of all, why, you're method actors, OK? Why are you here? <laughs> Were you someone that did well in the class, that you feel, oh, you did well on this pretest, you got the special invite? I know you're all close to being in student mode, because I see here a sign that says, no eating or drinking, and I see food and beverage throughout here. So you are definitely students. So I want to say welcome to our, uh, our discussion tonight, OK, or this afternoon. We're going to be learning aspects of metacognition to become an expert learner in this class and in other STEM classes as well. So as you know, we did a pretest. This x-axis is a pre-assessment that shows what I've seen historically as far as how students have an initial understanding and how that then allows me to predict how you're going to do on our first exam that we have in a week. Okay. This is the actual data at the bottom that covers you all right here. Okay. This was your pre-assessment data. So how are you going to do on the test? Well, most people are in this column right here. Does that mean you're going to get about 35 on the exam? 
or does it mean that you're going to do much better near 90%? Now, you might be fortunate enough to be way over in this bit. If you have great prior knowledge, you might get close to 100. Oh, man, you might get 60% on the test. What does this data tell you as scientists? Okay, we're all working to be scientists. What does this data tell you? If I have people come with the same prior knowledge and they either get close to 90 or close to 35. Check with the person next to you. Share an idea right now. What does this data tell you? There's something else going on. The comment that I overheard that I liked is there's something else going on. I agree with that. I think that this is a reflection of the learning that we're going to have to do in the next three weeks and then further on in the course. I think this person has a better learning strategy than this one. Let's explore that a little bit. This is what I did last year, okay? I shared the ideas on metacognitive learning strategies with my students. I had night class and an afternoon class. These were students that I did not share the information with. Same classes, these are the students that I shared the information with, the trend line I just brought over, okay? The students that I shared the information with were three times more likely to be above that line. They were three times more likely to overachieve. Wow. I need to get you above the line. Okay? Let me share the information right now that I think is going to get you above the line. This is the entire data set. What line do you want to be on? Okay? Quick aside, this is one of the biggest changes I've ever been able to achieve by just sharing one intervention and moving folks as a whole. Okay? So let me ask you this, students. Two questions for you to discuss here. Is there a difference, do you think, between studying for a chemistry test and learning chemistry for a test? And second, for which task would you work harder? If you needed to get an A on a test or if you needed to teach the material to the class? Quick aside, if you're teaching to the material to the class, you're in front of our 350 students right now. Okay? Check with the person next to you on this. Two different reflections here. For a group of three, yeah. I'll back up a little bit. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this learning is going to be different from studying. Definitely. Way on, because when you study there, they're just trying to memorize it now. You make it to that test. Right. And I'm probably more hard on it. I know. More people are down. Studying means sitting there with one person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're going to question you. They're going to question you. Yeah. I mean, I'll look probably exponentially harder for part B. <laughs> okay. So help me out with them this way. What do you think is the difference between studying and learning? What are you What are you reading as far as that? You know, so those two different ones. Well, because your answer depends on what you call study and what you call learning. How, what do you think that those are describing? Learning would be more in your long-term memory. Okay. And studying is more transitory within that? What do you think? Okay, okay. What, so if you were trying to say one is deeper than the other, <coughs> you're saying deep, learning would be a deeper one? I agree with you on that. Okay, I would say that in this class, something we need to be aware of, your success is going to depend on your understanding, your learning and how you then perform on our tests, not spending time in completing assignments. There are going to be classes that I'm sure you'll take where it is mainly about completing things. Spending time studying, turning things in, that's not this class, okay? All of those other things that we ask you to do when it comes to homework, going to recitation, all of those other features, we're designing those to try to support your learning and your understanding. Don't feel like, hey, I'm just completing things. I'm turning it in. I'm spending time studying. We need to have performance in this class. Okay. Now, in terms of performance on the second one, most all the students that I speak with within here, and I think you're no exceptions, 
you think that it would be very difficult to stand up here and teach the material. And I agree with you that. And why might that be? Well, you have to not know just what you're going to say, but what are the students going to ask you? What other dimensions do you know? Let's try to know the material well enough to teach it, and I think that will result in an A on the test. Okay? This is my classroom, right? So if you look around you, this is where we're at. Okay? We've got an upper balcony, we've got 350 bright students on day one. There's different things that we can do within the space. Okay? There's different ways that I can communicate information. We heard the idea that studying versus learning, one might recall a different level of retention. Okay? Quick thought within here. So if you want to retain information, some strategies work better than others. Okay? I'm not sure you can see, but way at the bottom here, greater retention, it says practice by doing. A demonstration, an audiovisual, reading. Place these three other ones on the pyramid. What activities do you think lead to greater retention of information when it comes to teaching others, lecture, and discussion group? One of them is way at the top, one of them is in the middle, one of them is way at the bottom. What's most effective? Teaching others. Teaching others. Teaching others. What do you think the weakest is way at the top? Lecture. Lecture. Okay. If you have the feeling that I'm trying to nudge you into discussion group, you're correct. Okay? <laughs> Within here. Lecture's way at the top, discussion group is better. If you can teach, even better within that one, okay? Now, a lot of times, folks will say to me, well, I go to class, I read the book, I don't understand why, why I'm struggling. Where is that on my pyramid? <laughs> Some of the worst strategy that you can simply use, okay? Let me show you another pyramid. How many folks have heard of Bloom's Taxonomy before? Wow, what high school class did you hear that in? <laughs> okay? <laughs> you, you must really be the AP students that I have within here, okay? This is what Bloom's taxonomy is. Okay. Decide. I usually get about one or two hands out of 300 that will say they have a sense of what Bloom's taxonomy is from a, from a high school setting. Okay. This pyramid reflects different levels of thinking we use when we're learning. Okay. Foundationally, we move up this pyramid. What's at the bottom? The bottom is things like memorizing information, being able to remember it, but not necessarily understand it. Higher than that, we now have to begin to summarize or translate that information. Take it from one setting and understand it in a different one. An application would be even higher. Now, I took our first test. I looked at our test, and you know what? About 15% of that exam is going to be at the bottom of the pyramid. And you are going to do great on that. Scores are near 100% on that. But most of the test here is in terms of comprehension and translating the idea from one spot to another. If you say, I did not recognize the questions, you were not able to translate it from one spot to another. Those are more difficult. Even higher yet, scores are more, are more, even lower within our set. Scientists, when I look at this, I think you have outstanding <laughs> skills developed in high school for the bottom of the pyramid. And we're not going to ask you that. You have outstanding skills to achieve right here. You have great learning strategies. But we now need to develop strategies to move higher on the pyramid. Okay? If you feel we're changing the rules of the game, yeah, we're changing the rules of the game. We're at a different spot of what you're going to be asked to you do. So let's look what it means now for what brain scientists have determined. What have cognitive scientists determined will move you higher up the pyramid? Okay. Now, if you, I've used the word metacognition a few times. Anybody know what metacognition is? This, yep, thinking about thinking. Usually people say that. Okay? Metacognition includes things about thinking about thinking, being aware of what we know and don't know, assessing our understanding, considering the strategies that we use. Different metacognitive learning strategies I show here. Okay? There's a host of these that I'm going to step through in just a second. If we're going to divide these up, I would say that cognitive scientists have learned what are better ways to learn when it comes to doing things before class, in the classroom, after class, and then when we prepare for a test. 
Let's look at the best strategies within each of those. Okay? So before class, you, we have a textbook. You paid for a textbook. How many folks, when you use a textbook, highlight? Every hand goes up. Okay? Mm -hmm. How many people use different colors? Almost every yep. hand goes up within that. Okay? <laughs> Highlighting the textbook is close to useless. There's a gasp that goes through the crowd. Okay? This is the only way that they know how to use a textbook. Okay? This has been very effective for the bottom of the pyramid. Okay? Highlighting a textbook requires almost no input from the student. Here's something in bold. Ah, here's something else in bold. If you're not paying attention at all, you can still highlight. There are even new digital textbooks where, yeah. yes, you can highlight, and you can also click a button that says, show me the highlighted version. You have not highlighted. It will go click, and it will turn it into looking like this. Okay? <laughs> Secondly, after you've wait, wait, highlighted wait, wait. it. I'm sorry, it's pre-highlighted? It is pre-highlighted. Okay. 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 Pre-highlighted. So why do the author bring you <laughs> Second thought is returning to a highlighted text is not very effective to learn from. Okay, you might say, well, I, at least it's good once I go back to it. It's pre highlighted. It is not effective to learn from either. Okay? Highlighting is going to take up your time and it does not increase retention. I'm going to highlight that. <laughs> highlight your time and not increase retention. Now, you bought a book. Let's explore what you can do with the book. Okay? I think a book is a crucial resource. A very low end but still successful thing to do is to preview the chapter before you come to class. Preview the chapter. How is it broken up into topics? What are the headings? What are the subheadings? The reason this is important is that when you're in my class, it is going to be really difficult to hear new information, process it, connect it to other information you know so you can retain it. That connect it to other information and have meaning for how the ideas fit together, the author has already told you how the ideas are going to fit together. If you have at least a preview for what the template is going to be, that will help your information, your, your re retention of information. Okay? Even better would be this active learning approach that Sandra describes. Read a paragraph, pause. Okay, what was the main theme within that? Read the next paragraph. Okay, how do I connect the two? You could write that down, but at the very least, you have to actively pause within that. Okay? Now, a lot of times, I know you're going to say, this is going to take too much time. How many times have you read the book and you're two pages into something and you don't remember a single thing you read? And you go back and you read it again. And you go back. This is actually doing it right the first time helps. Okay? Now, I had a student just the other day and he said, Dr. Clark, what you told me in that session really helped. And I'm like, well, what part? He said, when it came to reading the book. I said, well, show me what you're up to. So he pulls out his piece of paper. Here's the different sections. This was his takeaway paragraph after paragraph. He told me this is the first time a science textbook has ever been helpful. I used to read it, but now I'm finding information I can use. This was a senior here at OSU. This is the first time he was ever using a textbook effectively. Um, quick question. Yep. I was watching my daughter read a book and study. Yep. And it was an online book, and she was copying and pasting. Would you agree that's essentially the same thing as highlighting? Yeah. Right. So yep. really the suggestion then would be rather than copying right. and pasting, even if you're reading yep. it online, it's just type it. Then. Yeah, I don't think you're just thinking of your own words. Yeah, and I, I would even better, I, I would be doing it by hand and trying to make meaning with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, I'm really fascinated on this whole subject now. What does it mean, digital versus oh, right. old yeah, school? Yeah. How do you mm -hmm. code it in within that? Uh, there was a really interesting article I just saw that in, in every genre, the, a big meta study, a print version leads to a different experience and better retention of information than a digital. They've also found there's differences if you scroll through something versus you turn a page. That's another wow. feature. So you code things, you know, all of these I find what's fascinating for me is what do they find in this narrow cognitive study? Now how do I bring it to 300? Or how do I bring it to my 25? That's what I think is a really excited feature right now, okay? Uh, 
Now, if you really want to highlight something after you make your notes, okay, revisit those. Okay, you've already made sense of the information. If you have a pink highlighter that you have to use, this might be a time to use it. Okay? So I want you to commit right now in this class. When it comes to before class activities, what are you going to do? Are you going to wait and come to the art class? Are you going to outline the chapter and work on pre-class homework? Or are you going to do this active reading one? This is from most passive to most active. Okay? Tell the person next to you, what are you going to be doing this semester? I gotta be doing the middle still, but it's probably gonna be hot. I'll tell you what, the one class in this piece, some old, when I actually did read ahead, I understood much, so much better. Mm -hmm. If, right. you if I read, if I read Next thought here, notes about let's look at what we can do in class, okay? Two effective things, going to class, participating in the reviewing, and taking notes by hand. Taking notes by hand, folks, is filed. That's a better way to code in the information, okay? Uh, it allows you to do things like, hey, I want to draw a picture. I want to draw a figure within here. I make sense of this in different ways. And if you're an effective typer, you type in everything more literally than if you do when you're trying to make sense of it by hand, okay? Now, in this class, I try to set it up where we have information. It's also oftentimes a progression of ideas. We've got one thing, now let's add to that, let's add to that, let's move up the staircase. That's how our class is typically going to be run, okay? Now, you might find the class moves too fast for you. You're not able to keep up within this. The only way you can slow it down is to increase your prior knowledge. The only way, because I'm sorry, but we're going to be moving at this pace. It is so great to have an idea come up and you say, check. That's what I knew was going to happen. Check. Okay. The next one, wait. I knew that this one didn't make sense when I previewed it. I need to pay more attention now. I don't think you can pay attention to me for an hour at maximum attentiveness. But if you can spend the 10 minutes when you really need it, I need you to do that, okay? Previewing will slow the class down for you, okay? When I pose different questions along the way, it is so much better if you are able to actually attempt those versus just watching someone else, okay? That comes back to what kind of preview of information do you have, okay? Now, this poor little fellow right here, this baby who's going to go up the steps, those steps are awfully big for them. They have found that when a question is posed within our classroom space, if you don't have about 80% prior knowledge on that, you are going to get very frustrated, and it's going to be a waste of time for you. When I ask a question about the ideal gas law, you already know what PV, T, R, you already know what those stand for. You already know the units on those. You already know how to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. And then I'm going to ask us to do something with that. If you don't already know all of that symbolic language, you are just going to get frustrated with it. Folks have found that when it comes to reading a text, if you don't know about 95% of the words on the page, you get really frustrated with it. Okay? Think about your most frustrating experience fast reading Shakespeare. You still knew almost all of those words, but the couple outliers really upset you. Okay? Okay. As we go through, we'll be trying to make clear what the learning objectives are. I'm going to try to say these are typical things we're going to do with the information. Please be attentive to those. Okay. And then finally, do you remember what we've talked about? You might be really engaged and we have a great conversation and you laughed when I had a joke. Okay. But what are you going to remember? If you don't remember it, it's not helpful. Okay. There's this movie called Inception. I like it. Because it's made me think, I'm in the business now of making memories. Okay? What does it mean to make a memory? This is what a cognitive scientist would tell you. Okay? We get a host of sensory data. Right now, you have information coming to you, what you see, what you hear, how the person next to you smells. You've got a lot of information. Okay? A lot of that, then, it initially goes into your sensory memory, but most of it is not retained. Your brain is right now prioritizing what is important or not, okay? Most of the information in the world around us is lost. Some of it goes into our short-term memory. Now, when it's in your short-term memory, you can try to make it stick there. One thing that you can do is what's called rehearsal. You repeat the information again and again. 614-477-1282. 614-477-1282. 
Okay, that's my cell phone number. If I say it about five times in a row, I think it will stick at least in the short term. Not the best strategy, though, okay? It'd be a funny class if that was my whole strategy. Okay, let's repeat it. Do, 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 do. All right, next idea. Let's repeat it. We don't do that, okay? Instead, we're going to try to connect it to other information, okay? If it's not somehow transferred to your long-term memory, you lose the information, okay? We want to try to make meaning to connect it to this deeper information. Now, this is a cool one. Notice the arrows here go both ways. There's information we put in the long term, and then we bring it back to the short term. That bringing it back, this is a really cool one. When you bring information from your long term back to the short term memory, you make different neural connections that helps you remember it. The difference between an expert and a novice, polyatomic anions, I have recalled that information for 30 years. Okay? You've recalled it for 30 days. So I have a really big expressway to go from my long-term memory back to my short-term memory on that. I need you to frequently recall the information to give yourself a better pathway back, okay? This is a really interesting one, okay? Mentally reviewing the information, okay? I was fortunate enough to go to Ireland two years ago with my wife. We went to different bed and breakfast. We were there for like 10 days. Different little Irish town each day, different restaurant. The last day, I say, okay, so without looking at our calendar, let's think where we were each day. What was the bed and breakfast like, and where did we eat dinner? We mentally brought back the information, and I remember it now, okay? I, when I posted it to her, my wife's in education, she goes, this is one of those cognitive things, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah. But by recalling it within that, it helps to make it stick, okay? So a really good one. This is almost like cheating. After class, later in the day, without looking back at your notes, okay, what were the three or four main ideas that we talked about? What did we do? It's not gonna be easy, okay? You're gonna have to make your brain work to recall the information. I can't do it in this classroom because you have not forgotten the information enough. You need to have a gap of time when you've forgotten it and then later in the day, Without looking at your notes, okay, what did we do? That is a really powerful strategy that's not going to take you but three or four minutes, okay? So when it comes to now, what we're going to do in class, you can attend every class. You can be able to have enough of a head start so you can treat what we're doing as a self-test and get feedback on what you don't know and don't know. Even better, do that, but also mentally review the information later in the day, okay? Once again, I want you to commit to what you're going to be doing, okay? Now, after class then, two ideas here. What does it mean to do homework as an assessment and to learn from one's mistakes, okay? Now, most students, man, this was definitely me in every math class I ever took. Mm -hmm. How do I solve a problem? Well, you ask me, I'm going to look at an example that's back in my notes because I want to get it right. You ask me to solve for x. Oh wait, here's an example solving for y. Got it. Let me go back and now I'll reproduce this from a sample problem or from my notes, because I'll, I'll get it right then, okay? That's the absolute worst way to do your homework, okay? And everyone, another gasp. What? Yeah. That is my only way to do homework <laughs> within here. Why is this so bad, okay? You are not actually testing yourself. You are looking back to a template and reproducing it. Is this wrong? It is if you think that you are testing yourself. Because how many times on the test am I going to give you all that information? <coughs> Never. Okay? What I have found here is it is so much more effective. Study the material first and then try to apply it. Put it in your head first. And then to see what is what's in your head sufficient to answer the problem. You are never going to have these other resources. And I would say most insidious, most diabolical, you are going to tell yourself you know how to do the problem because you have looked back to a template. When you come to my office hours and say, wow, when you do it on the board, Dr. Clark, yeah, it makes sense. I can follow what you're doing. And then I can't do it on the test. Yeah, you saw me do it. I know what I'm doing, all right? Mm -hmm. Have you authentically tested yourself? 
when I say this was my approach, every calculus class I ever had, this is what I did. And I thought that I was learning it. And I did not do well in cal calculus, okay? Took the class three times, B plus every time, okay? Now, this would be a better approach. Review the content first, and then try to answer questions. Give yourself an honest evaluation. What, are you, what is your metacognition telling you? Is it an easy topic for you? Would you be able to teach this material? Can you even prepare other related questions? Excellent. Now, some topics that will be true, but a lot of them, I think you're going to need to learn more. It might be re returning to this first material, or maybe you have to go to other resources. Okay? Don't think because you didn't know it the first time that there aren't additional things to do. You need to learn more, and if you learn more, you have to retest yourself. If you are not able to eventually give yourself an honest evaluation and put it in this box, you're not going to do well on our test. Okay? That first one, when I say the topic is easy, if you have identified a mistake in your processing, Oh, I need to make sure I square the denominator. If you've identified something, give yourself a big asterisk, teach yourself right there. Remember, square the denominator, okay? As you are working on your problems, those are the best study resource you have. You are revisiting how your brain worked when you were solving problems. If you have learned something, make a note of it, okay? This idea of I can teach it. Now, in Sandra's book here, she's a really big proponent of saying, teach the material. If you have a classmate at the, along the way, take turns teaching the material to each other. Okay, now, I know a lot of folks, that's what ha might be happening in the classroom. That happens outside of the classroom, too. Now, maybe you don't have a classmate who's in the same chemistry class. Get someone down the floor, okay, in your dorm room. They don't have to be in the class. They will listen to you. Now, maybe you don't have any friends down the hall. Okay? Call your grandmother. Grandmother, let me tell you about buffers. Okay? <laughs> Heaven forbid, you might not have a grandmother. Okay? But I bet you you have at least some object in your room that will listen to you. <laughs> I have more ficuses that can pass this class. Because every day a student says, I come home, and what I do, I teach the material to my plant. Okay? So powerful. Now... Sort of an aside, why is it so powerful? Okay? There's this book, Improving Students' Learning with Effective Learning Techniques. This is a cognitive psych one. Really good paper. They look at about eight different practices. They say, does the evidence show this works or does not work? And how easy is it now to have the masses adopt this in their class? You need to train. So they'll talk about, does highlighting work or not work? Does this strategy work or not work? Okay. This is one that my colleague Andrew Heckler pointed to me, and this is a really helpful one, okay? This idea of I can teach it. Let me show you this one. I, I sort of think now as an educator, this is the gold mine right here, okay? What they did is they did a study where they said, do a problem, report the answer. Do a problem, report the answer, and at the end, explain what you did. Or do a problem, and as you go along, concurrently explain what you are doing. Okay? Now, in a concrete problem where it's a very constrained one, there is a difference. Look at this difference when it's an abstract problem. Unbelievable difference. Why might, I'm going to throw this to you to discuss, why might a concurrent self-explanation be so powerful when it comes to abstract problems? Check with the person next to you. What do you think is going on with that? It's kind of like the self-correcting thing of taking notes versus highlighting. It's like keeps it mentally. If I'm talking about something that doesn't make sense, I'm going to fix it then. I'm going to work hard to give good mental thought to fix it to make sure it's consistent. If you're not saying it to yourself, I don't know if you do that. I think you, you fool yourself. Yeah. yeah. 
But it's a lot of times, though, the abstract problems have multiple pathways to mm -hmm. solutions. So if you have multiple pathways to solution, then you can then you can explain your pathway through someone else's pathway. That's good. And you can compare similarities. Yeah. In, so, so I'm hearing that. some good, very interesting sort of a rationale within this in terms of what does it mean to be evaluating with different pathways, hearing the information. Um, my initial take on this is if you are seeking to do a concurrent self-explanation, you can't bullshit yourself. You have <laughs> metacognition. Hey, do I really know what I'm saying here? Or do I usually hope that I get three quarters of the way through it? Oh, now it's beginning to make sense. If you are teaching it along the way, wow, you don't have any gap within that to say, do I really know what I'm talking about or not? Kathy mentioned in terms of my involvement through the years of modeling. After reading this one, I started to say, huh, you know, I wonder if, I won't say the only thing, the best thing that modeling does, it stresses concurrent explanations on abstract thinking. Okay, you're at the whiteboard. How are you going through this? It definitely includes a retrospective self-explanation, but it's like, man, maybe everything that I've ever done successfully as a teacher is really when I've given space for this. Yeah? It's like, how can I make this class so that every 10 minutes I'm making it socially acceptable for you to talk out loud and do a concurrent self-explanation? Yeah? Now, this process that I've described right here this isn't necessarily quick. In our homework system, I can see every click you make, okay? Now, if I have something due at midnight, two days before a few things trickle in, a day before a few things trickle in, and then it goes like this, okay? Does it go after that, though? I'll tell you what happens after that, okay? Because they had one where they did a whole thing in Indiana where they studied click usage throughout within that. And they looked at when people used, like, read the digital book, or they were looking at an online one. Where do you think the peak is for, like, reading the text and engaging it that way? Not doing the homework, but, like, reading the text. The peak, the the peak is between midnight and 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> because they've had deadlines to turn in homework in different classes at midnight. And then it goes up. So when I put this on here, I might be just an old guy to say, look, you waited till midnight. No, their prime might be between 10 o'clock and 2 a.m. for when they're getting stuff done. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. I'm going to sleep for four hours by the time midnight comes around and that. Okay. Now, my point is, is that if you want to do this deeper understanding for spending your homework, if it's not about completion, if it's about learning, hey, it's very difficult to have that take place at 11.55. What I think you need to do is you need to schedule your time, okay? If you were being asked to learn how to skateboard and you knew you had an event three weeks from now, you would schedule your time. If the first class was, hey, I'm going to learn about the equipment, then I'm going to learn how to start and stop, and then I'm going to move on to turning, I think you better master the equipment before you move on to the next stage. You can't say, well, let me make sense of it all here at the end. Because, you know, the next thing that's going to happen is your class is going to include all these other components. You are going to be doing a board side, a 5-0 grind, an ollie, a kickflip. I don't know what any of these are, okay? <laughs> but when I Googled it, this is what I found. Okay? What I'd like you to do right now is... Compare the learning of chemistry with the learning of skateboarding. Compare and contrast those. Okay? <coughs> Check, share ideas with the person next to you. You probably know, my students know more about skateboarding. Okay? <laughs> you probably know about chemistry. How would you compare and contrast those? Okay? I would say I need a lot more to shake it than skateboarding. Yeah, exactly. In two days in between. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say start we get the starting stopping from the beginning. Yeah, you have to you have to know so say Mike is now you know, material science, you know, how that table better understand what the elements and you know your symbols and so forth. Yeah. Yeah.
And it, well, I guess what's happening is the thing is, is, look at all those things that you go through for your event, for your Okay, now in my in my big class, I have found. I can now say, okay, I only want to hear from people that are skateboarders, and I have plenty of those. I found I can even say, I only want to hear from people that brought their skateboard to class with them today. Mm -hmm. And I still have enough that will do that. Okay, I'm amazed that skateboarding has persisted. Right? And when I mean, it, to me, it got big in the 80s. The two main proponents were Bart Simpson and Michael J. Fox. And it's like, it's not very effective, right? You need some skill, and soon yeah, it's like that. It's not really helping you that much. If you would have said this would be going on, I would have said, no, I'm going to do the over-under. I'm going to bet against skateboarding. I'm amazed that it's persisted. It's not that anymore. It's not a mode of transportation. It, it is a mode now, at least on my campus now, because what they do is they have these ones that have like a motor on Yeah. Them. <laughs> and it's like, well, you're not even pushing. And they're going, and this person hops off, and I'm like, oh, let me help pick up their board. It's on a remote. They put it on reverse, and it comes back to no. them. No. Yes! Yes, they got a remote with it. That's not right. I'm telling you. But anyways... So let me just call on the ones that I think are, are serious borders in this spot. I think you're a serious border. What is your thought as far as comparing the two? It seems like they'd be comparable that you have to do one before you do the next. Okay, so it seems like there might be this, this uh, learning building on other features. I'm with you within that. What do you all think? Compare and contrast. If you say one of them is more fun, I agree chemistry is more fun. But <laughs> do you think, I mean, how might they be different? Or what, what was your conversation like? You went to um, developing basic skills. You okay. Know, you can, to then progress into applications of problems, for example, online, versus somebody who's more sophisticated doing that. Online or whatever. Yes. And then we, what we didn't get to is the method here looked like real um, synthesis. These were advanced, more advanced skills. Uh -huh. Whereas in class, you're going to go to where you understand the material well enough to teach it. And I guess I was thinking that something similar would be do you know well enough to design your own skateboard? Or trick. Yeah. Or trick. Yeah. You also get skateboard line, you get immediate feedback on the. You have outstanding <laughs> metacognition when you are skateboarding. <laughs> you are getting feedback every 30 seconds. Okay? Was I successful on that? Was I successful on that? Could I do this? Could I do this? Back to my earlier phrase. You can't BS yourself. Okay? The feedback is unavoidable within this. Okay? I would also say, when I look at skateboarders around, I think it's fairly high on blooms. When I see skateboarders, they're not like me and just say, oh, let me go on something nice and flat and go from here to here and back and back. Extremely creative. They are trying new things again and again in an authentic setting. Okay? I think that that's why this, I mean, within all my strategies within this, you skateboarders are very high within what you're trying to do, okay? And getting feedback, challenging yourself, putting yourself out there in an authentic way. Let's see if we can do the same thing within our chemistry, okay? Now, quick pause within this. First time I tried to say, let's take an everyday example, see what does it mean to schedule it, put it in. I chose cooking. You first have to learn how to chop before you saute, before you do this. Completely fell flat. None of them had any of those skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is a much better connection for them, okay? So, in terms of after class, we have our series of activities, okay? Last thought, then, would be when it comes to preparing for tests. First thought, aiming for 100% mastery, okay? Conversation I'm going to have after you come into class, if you did not do well on the exam, I'm going to ask, did the topics, were they the ones that you expected? And I think you're going to say yes because I think we're going to do a good job of seeing what our learning objectives are along the way. My second thing I'm going to ask you is, okay, if you could do, if, what 
made you think you would get it right on the exam? Then? If you knew the topic, why did you think you could get it right on the exam? Because you didn't get it right here. And if you say to me, well, I get it right if you ask me this way, but not this way. You know I'm going to ask you the way that you can't do it. Okay? You have to aim for 100% mastery. If your metacognition says you are not at that particular value yet, that, that level of competency, that's what your metacognition is telling you. It's telling you, and I think you knew that, you need to continue on the learning process. Okay? This person, when it comes to consolidating information, you have information leading up to your exam coming from a lot of different sources. There's the textbooks and the notes you might have made, taken, the slides I provide, end of chapter problems that are within that, homework along the way. You cannot go back to all of those and process that and make sense of it for an exam. What I did as a student, this was the only effective strategy I used out of this whole set. I would concisely summarize the information. I'd say, okay, in chapter two, what are the main ideas? Let me now write it in a way that makes sense to me. This was me consolidating the information. A lot of you folks on the physics side, this idea of, okay, take all the information, put it on a three by five card. That's what I then said, hey, that will work in my history class. That will work in my psych class. Let me take, because you never go back to the card anyways, let me take that and consolidate the information in a meaningful way. If you can do that chapter by chapter as we go through, that is a great way to be making sense of the information, okay? So we have the different things that you can do when it comes to exam prep. We'll talk more about these as we get closer to the exam. Now, I would say for all of these, if you put yourself in a particular box, I need you to begin using that. If you don't begin to use the practices right now, thanks for playing. You are not going to say a month from now, oh, now let me try this. Start putting this into your skill set, OK? Now, I know. If you're at the bottom here, the most passive, you're going to get about a C in this class. And if you look around and say, wait, I go to lecture, I attend every class, I complete the homework at the last minute, <laughs> and I look back to the class slides, everyone in here comes to every class. Okay? Everyone is doing these sets right here. They are completing the things. This is not supporting their understanding. Now, I know some of you, maybe you're athletes, you've got a second job. Who knows what you're up to? Time is at a premium. These ones in the middle here take very little additional time, and they really work. Simply outlining the chapter so you can treat your experience as a self-test, okay? consolidating the information along the way. These take very little additional input, and they will make a big difference. The ones at the top within here, they all reinforce themselves. If you have prior knowledge due to active reading, it will make it easier to do these other features, and your mental review will be more beneficial. You'll be able to do all of these. If you're on the best path on the top, it's just win, win, win. Now, in this class within here, I am going to set this up so that my practices support all the top ones. I want to make it inevitable for you to learn more chemistry than you ever thought possible, because I'm going to be setting up a framework that supports your best practices. Okay. I would say within this, we're all in this together. Okay. Teamwork is the secret that makes common people achieve uncommon results. Everyone in here getting an A in this class is uncommon. Notice they're all wearing little lab coats. Okay. This is <laughs> uncommon within here. I want my boss to say, what the hell happened, Clark? Every one of your students got an A in here. I think we can do that if we work together and use the very top, top strategies. All right, have at it, team. All right, that's my pitch to him. Okay, questions, comments. I'm going to talk more about what I then see in terms of actual effectiveness. What's working more? What do top students do? That's sort of my tease. That's my afternoon. But what are questions, people's thoughts within what we're discussing? Here? I do want to defend your your colleague that says my students aren't working hard because I could argue that what that colleague meant was. They're not using those top strategies. I'm trying to be yeah. generous to your the, the criticism within that is that they think, no, they're, they would say they're not even using the top strategies. They're saying they, they need to spend six hours each week in this class, and they're not. I think that within that, 
They need to. And I, I come back to that as a high school athlete. I played a lot of basketball. I did not like the basketball coaches that said, "Clark, you just got to want that loose ball. You got to dive on the floor to get that one." The football coaches told me that. Okay, the ones that I like, maybe it's because I go on to grad school, or the ones that. Oh no, look. You've just got to position yourself here. The rebound is going to come off the basket 80% of the time. You be right here. I like to be smarter, not just say, you got to work harder. And the students within this, they are going to be committing time. But for all of it, whether they have a lot of time, little time, hey, let's all know what the best strategies are. Yeah. So I know this year Ohio State freshmen got iPads. Yeah. And I saw a student using one of those at the physics talk last week, mm -hmm. taking notes. Yeah. It looked like by hand. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they can do with it. Yes. But is there any research to see whether that type of electronic yeah. note taking is effective compared to yeah. the app that they're doing within that? There's one called Notability, okay. where you can take like a PDF. And so I provide like scaffold notes ahead of class. Before, I'd have three quarters of the people print those out. Mm -hmm. Now, nah, and then other people will write in other ways. Now three quarters of the people have their, their iPad and they're filling it in along the way within that. Um, we've got three instructors that have iPad only sections and they're studying that. Okay. Um, the feature that I like about that is that I might try next year. I used to within the paper one is I'd hand out three by five cards. And if there were problems that involved calculations, those are not great for like a clicker setup because it spreads out. As soon as you say do the math on it, it's really difficult to have people wait and get to the final answer. Because if it involves math, it really spreads out the time. So it's like, I'm going to hand out three by five cards and I'll see what your process was. Okay, stop. Let's turn them in. Okay? And you could also imagine, hey, give it to the person next to you. Oh, have them complete it. You know, so I was excited about that. I had a big stack of three by five cards. Didn't work great because students turn it back in. I want them to keep the product that they're working on along the way. I, I want both the snapshot, but I want them to be able to have what they were processing. So my thought is on this notability one, I can have them do it and then, okay, everybody, right now, take a screenshot, boom, send that to me. So I can get sort of an update. So that's my thought of how I might be using it technology-wise. They are writing, but I don't know if it codes in differently. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you either revisit or survey students to see if they're still buying into? Yeah. So I, I'm going to have a very consistent message throughout where I bring up features of this quite frequently. Okay. Um, and I've studied quite a bit. Okay. After the first midterm, let me see what people are up to. Okay. At the end of it, I have a very, uh, I've studied that. It's one of the things I'll explore this afternoon. Uh, okay, what practices are students actually adopting? One thing that I found effective is after I get the picture, picture, I send the class a message as a whole and say, okay, tell me what your plan is before class, in class, after class. Commit to these. Tell me what you're going to do. Because that then allows me to come back three weeks later. Hey, Steve, you said that before class you would be doing this. I noticed that you don't necessarily, you know, is that going on? because you don't really seem to come prepared or something like that. So I have them commit, and then that gives me an inside information I can return to. Hey, it made sense when I pitched it. Are you really adopting it now? So I, I do that, too. Other thoughts within it? A couple ones as far as specific features that are in her pitch within this. She's going to say that you absolutely have to have data at the start to commit to have so, to convince someone to do this. We do it for the group as a whole in all of our general chemistry now after the first exam because we have specific data that we can have the student reflect on. Did you meet your goal or not? I have found that my pretest that I use that's just as convincing because I can show this X Y and say, look. Are you going to get 30% or 90%? Yeah. That convinces them right there. Okay, so that's the data that I use. Second is um, when we do the in-class one, we don't tell them that this is what's going to go on. They're showing up to expect a lecture on stoichiometry, and we give this instead. Okay? We use language like metacognitive learning strategies, Bloom's taxonomy, because they've already heard about study skills. 
They don't listen if you say, let me give you study skills. So you notice I frequently mention metacognitive learning strategies, Bloom's taxonomy, cognitive science. They tune in if you say that. Okay? I now, and I, I mentioned that, hey, they, these are the kinds of things I study. So when people come, when the students come to me now, they latch on to that. So you're really interested in how do people learn before class? Okay, tell me more about that. So whether you study that or not, if you say, look, I'm really interested in how we learn in this way, that helps them buy in too. I wonder, like you said, having the data, if you ask them right before they took first exam, what do you think you're going to get on this, mm -hmm. and what did you do to prepare for this, Yeah. and then after, like, did, did that match your prediction? Yeah, so within that, that's one thing that folks study. I've studied a little bit. What I find within my work, and this resonates with the students, is if I say, okay, before this test, would you say you have a really strong understanding? Good understanding, moderate understanding, put yourself in a bin within that. They do a very good job of putting themselves in the correct bin. People have good metacognitive awareness of their understanding of the material. But at the same time, they have found that weaker students have somehow a poor understanding. How do you get both of those? If I rephrase the question and say, predict your score, the students that have a moderate understanding, they say, okay, I think that'll lead to about a 75. Not on a multiple choice science test. They're going to be able to know something about every topic, eliminate things, and then they're down to a 50-50 guess. So that is, they, they have not reached mastery on it. They know something about almost every topic, so that is how a weak student, because there's other classes where they're like, oh, I don't really know, but I still end up with about a 75. Not in my class. <laughs> so I think that that's what ends up, how both of those make sense. And when I tell students that, that's all, it's a little bit more hypothesis by me than hard data. They believe that. They said, yeah, that was true. Okay. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand off the baton here to our next slide. Thank okay. you. Cool. Thank you. Five minute break. There's yeah. lots of food over across the hallway, there's lots of drinks. Um, talk to